Wilson's disease is a rare hereditary disorder that affects the body's ability to metabolize copper. While copper in small amounts is an essential mineral for a healthy body, in amounts too large, copper can become toxic. The purpose of this video is to give an overview of Wilson's disease, as well as look at implications for the physical therapist assistant. As with any hereditary disorder, we must look to the genetic makeup. The cause of Wilson's disease goes back to a mutated recessive gene that is responsible for forming a protein which transports copper. People who have this mutated ATP7B gene are unable to transport copper from the liver into the bile where it can be eliminated from the body. As a result, copper begins to accumulate in the liver after being ingested through a normal diet. Once accumulated in the liver, it begins to break down cells causing scar formation and dysfunction. Copper travels through the blood to other organs such as the brain, kidneys, and the eyes. Since the liver and the brain are most highly affected, hepatic and neurological symptoms are common. If presenting with the hepatic form of Wilson's disease, symptoms may include jaundice, fatigue, edema, easy bruising, swelling of the liver or spleen, hemoptysis, and even osteoporosis. If the CNS is highly involved, then there may be neuromuscular and psychiatric symptoms. Examples of neuromuscular symptoms may include dysarthria, which is difficult speech, dysphagia, difficult swallowing, drooling, ataxic movements and tremors, muscle stiffness, and joint pain. In some case studies, psychiatric symptoms often present as a precursor to the other symptoms. These may include personality changes, depression or elation, irritability, mania, hallucinations, seizures, or a general intellectual decline. The occurrence of Wilson's disease is approximately 1 in 30,000 to 1 in 40,000. It affects men and women the same, and symptoms may occur between the ages of 5 and 35 years old. Once Wilson's disease is suspected, it can be diagnosed by several tests. First, an eye exam can be performed with an instrument called a slit lamp in order to determine the presence of Kaiser Fleischer rings. These copper tainted rings are present in patients who have CNS involvement. While they are present only 50% of the time in patients with hepatic symptoms only. Other tests may include blood and urine tests for the presence of copper or hepatic copper levels which can be taken from a liver biopsy. Even though these tests will determine the presence of Wilson's disease, the, diagno the diagnosis is often a lengthy period. The reason for this is that symptoms may resemble symptoms of other diseases such as schizophrenia, multiple sclerosis, epilepsy, or even substance abuse. After a correct diagnosis is made, treatment needs to begin immediately in order to reduce the high levels of copper. Pharmaceuticals called copper chelating agents are used to do this. Also, diet modification is necessary in order to, re to maintain low copper, copper levels. Medication and diet modification is a lifelong process and it must be maintained throughout the life. With treatment, symptoms will often lessen or disappear over a period of a year. However, some people may occur serious damage to the liver and require a liver transplant. The medical prognosis is very good, provided that there is early detection. If left untreated, however, this progressive disorder can eventually cause liver failure and ultimately death. Early screening is recommended for everyone with a family history of the disease, even if they are asymptomatic. So far, we've discussed the mechanism, diagnosis, and treatment involved with Wilson's disease. Now let's look at the implications for the physical therapist. 
Based on the NAGI disablement model, the therapist must evaluate patients based on their impairments, functional limitations, and disabilities in order to determine the most appropriate plan of care. Since the disease often presents in a variety of ways, careful consideration must be made with treatments. Some common physical impairments include decreased coordination and balance due to ataxic movements, decreased strength, decreased posture, decreased range of motion due to contractures or painful joints, impaired swallowing and speaking. Functional limitations may include being unable to sit or stand with proper posture or being able to ambulate properly or perhaps being unable to hold a pen or pencil to write. These impairments and functional limi limitations may create a variety of disabilities as well. Due to psychiatric or neuromuscular symptoms, there may be an inability to perform at work or at school. There may be an inability to keep up with the peers at school or inability to participate in social or leisure activities. Secondary intervention is possible by, by educating patients about the disease and encouraging early screening for children who may be asymptomatic in order to keep symptoms from occurring at all and preventing any damage. Much of the therapy provided will be tertiary in order to lessen the effects of the disease and to improve functionality. The plan of care may involve therapeutic ex exercise, manual therapy, modalities, and education. Therapeutic exercise may include postural stabilization, balance and coordination training, gait training, neuromuscular education or re-education, range of motion activities, stretching and strengthening exercises, as well as muscle lengthening. The intensity and progression of the exercise program will depend on the extent of the disease, the organ involvement, and the individual's overall health. If a patient is suffering from jaundice due to liver disorders, this would definitely be a contraindication for exercise. Precautions must be taken during any manual therapy in order to, um, in order to prevent any bruising or fractures from occurring. Modalities may also be used in order to reduce pain and help stretch muscles, such as superficial heat or ultrasound. These may be used providing that there is no inflammation present. Other contraindications may include um, an, unstable an unstable psychiatric state. While therapeutic exercise and moda modalities can be beneficial, Education is also a very important part of intervention. Areas that the patient and the patient's family may need education on include compliance with medications and their diet, early screening of family members, risk reduction for falls due to ataxia or osteoporosis, and also by promoting self-care, further mental and physical deterioration can be avoided. In conclusion, the early detection of Wilson's disease is critical in order to reduce the potential for serious organ damage. Through lifelong medications and diet modification, this disease can be kept under control. With the additional intervention that, that physical therapy can provide, patients may be able to lead more normal and productive lives.